the car service picked me up at 8.30. By the time I got to the airport, um, it gets a little bit murky, but you know, definitely the first plane had hit. I was on my way to the gate and I and, you know, passed a TV in a lounge somewhere. And there were, you know, a, a little bit of a crowd of people uh, watching, but we were all watching sort of in disbelief, even though the newscasters were saying that it was a commercial plane, nobody believed it. We all thought, how could it be a commercial plane? It had to be a private plane. It's terrible. Um, but I don't know if this was a level of denial or whatever. I still tried to get on my flight to go to Toronto. And as when I got to the gate, they said the flight was delayed. Then they said the flight was canceled. And I even went back down to the ticketing area to see if I could um, reschedule, to see if I could just get a later flight. I still didn't think it was that um, urgent, you know, or that anything, you know, that big had happened. Uh, but then you started to hear murmurs and then they said that they were shutting the airport down. And then that's when I believed, okay, a commercial flight, this is, this is weird. And as I was leaving, but I'm still not sure if at that point I knew there were, I must've known that there were two flights that hit, but I, I don't remember if I believed it or not. As I was leaving the airport with everybody else, um, a flight attendant was passing by and she said, they hit the Pentagon. This is ter terrorist. And then you can feel like the level of uh, adrenaline and panic or whatever happened at the airport. People who had been waiting online for the taxis, the line just disintegrated and now everybody was just clamoring for a taxi, but the taxis weren't going into Manhattan. Um, I was somehow able to get a cab and then I asked anybody else if they were going to Brooklyn and um, uh, a woman got in the cab with me uh, and we went back to Brooklyn and listening to the news reports and we were both just stunned. We really couldn't even speak and got back to Brooklyn. Uh, the driver couldn't even get me all the way to my um, place because traffic was just getting snarled and, and I ended up, you know, having to walk um, uh, like 15 blocks with my luggage. And anyway, got home and uh, my wife, Joe, and our nephew, Nate, who was staying with us at the time, they were glued to the TV. Um, oh, one thing that I forgot to say was that while I was at the airport, um, somebody who had a transistor radio informed us that, um, was it the South Tower that collapsed first? Um, uh, that, that the tower collapsed and nobody believed him. Nobody could even fathom it. We just thought that he was you know, heard something wrong, or he was just, you know, not right, you know, and, uh, but of course, then we heard the, the, the news reports on the radio in the cab. By the time I got home, the second tower had collapsed. And yeah, that day was just, um, you know, like everybody else, we were, I was in shock. We were all in shock. I ended up picking up my son from school and taking home a friend of his, who lived in Manhattan, who had no way, his parents had no way of uh, coming to Brooklyn to uh, pick him up. So he stayed the night with, with us. And, you know, just glued to the TV and the radio all day. And it wasn't until I got the initial reports of how many firefighters were probably um, uh, missing was at that time they were estimating about a hundred. And that was just devastating. That was, you know, um, I mean, it was, the whole thing was devastating to just imagine all the people who worked in that building. 
Um, but it didn't, I, it, I couldn't really feel it. It was just, I was too much in shock. I couldn't really take in um, that information until I heard the number of fire fighters. And then, you know, having been a former firefighter and having responded to the World Trade Center as a firefighter, you know, back in the uh, early eighties, I knew that my old company, <clears throat> Engine 55, were there. And I immediately started calling the firehouse, <clears throat> no answer. You know, I just called multiple times during, during the day, just couldn't get any information. And then the next morning, uh, I decided that I just needed to get to the firehouse. And um, I remember asking my wife, Jo, uh, if she would give me a haircut because my helmet, I, I still have my old Engine 55 helmet and turnout coat. And uh, my hair was long at the time, probably like, like this. And she cut my hair, you know, short so that the felt that, that the helmet, it was still tight, but I, but I could fit it on my head. I um, just grabbed my helmet, my um, turnout coat, uh, a backpack. I took along my video ca camera as well, just instinctively. Uh, you remember those like little handy cams that, that people had? And took the F train from Brooklyn to uh, Delancey Street on the way to the firehouse, which is on Broom Street. I stopped at a hardware store and, and got gloves because I thought if there's any way that I could get in there and help, I wanted to. Um, showed up at the firehouse and there was nobody there. Uh, but a firefighter drove, uh, who was driving back um, from the site, uh, he told me, he filled me in on uh, the status of the company and the guys that were missing. <clears throat> and one of them I knew very well, uh, who I had worked with, uh, Faust Apostle. And he, I asked him if he would drive me to the site and he, and he drove me in, past all the checkpoints and he got me as close as he could. And um, I thanked him, I left. And then I just walked around for a couple of hours, um, sort of, yeah, in disbelief and shock because everything was just covered in that uh, you know, that white dust. Um, and yeah, I started videotaping some and then, but I really wanted to find my company. I had no idea how I would. And I just, as I got closer and closer to ground zero, uh, then I started to run into firefighters and some of them who I knew and they would tell me who they knew that was lost. And finally, I made it, you know, um, very close, but I didn't have access to really be on the pile. And then I happened to see some guys that I knew, uh, at, some 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 firefighters who were still on the job that I that I had worked with uh, in the '80s, and they were surprised to see me. And and um, I asked them if I if I could if I could help. And the first thing the captain said to me, Captain Toomey, he said, uh, you know, I could tell he was, he didn't really want me to go in with him. And he says, well, do you have gloves? And I said, yes, I do. You know, and uh, he really, I guess he didn't know how to say no. And he, and he had to get back in with, with the guys because they were just taking a break. And, um, and we went in, you know, I went in with them and um, that first day was just helping to clear rubble. You know, there were those bucket lines uh, where you just kind of put in debris and just passed it along. And, um, and then every once in a while, 
you know, a body bag would be called for. And so then a body bag was passed up the line. And then a few minutes later, the bag would have remains in it. And what was striking about it was that in the big, you know, the bags didn't feel full, you know, it just felt like, you know, it was partial remains. Um, and sometimes we would take it to the makeshift morgue that they had set, set up and then, and then just get back on uh, the bucket line. And it was just an amazing experience. And so yeah, so engine 55 was missing five of their members. Um, and so I was, you know, sort of getting acquainted with some of the newer members working with some of the guys that I had known. But there was one guy there who was my age and he was in, he was in, you know, full gear. And I didn't understand how, how I didn't know him. I thought, well, if he worked at 55, we would have been there at the same time and I should know him. Um, but we didn't really have time to talk until we got back to the firehouse. At the end of the day, we went back to engine 55 and what I learned was uh, his name is Cliff Russell and he was, he was there helping to look for his brother, Stephen Russell, who was a firefighter at engine 55. And that morning, Captain Toomey, uh, Chris, uh, Cliff Russell showed up at the firehouse and, the, and he was very distraught. And uh, the captain said, just, just come, come with us, you know? And I think it really helped him to be able to be there. You know, one of the things that I remember about that day was that, and in days after, is that so many people wanted to help. You know, people wanted to give blood, people wanted to volunteer, and there was limited access, you know, to the site. And I just felt privileged that I was able to have access through my old company. And I was so grateful for them to allow me to work with them. And we got back to the firehouse and I asked if I could join them the next, the next day. And they said, yeah, just show up, you know, come here in the morning, you know, uh, you know, before, before nine or whatever time. And then you could ride in with us on, on, uh, they had a makeshift, uh, I guess they had a makeshift rig because their rig was buried. Um, and so for the next few days, I, you know, I rode in with them and I just helped out on uh, the pile. And yeah, it was still, you know, it was very smoky. It was burning. Um, every once in a while, the work would stop um, because they thought there were survivors and they were trying to listen, you know, so if so, the word would just get out that everybody had to be silent because they were trying to listen if somebody was either calling for help or tapping or doing something. And each time that happened, it ended up, you know, being a false alarm, you know, that it, that while I was there, I don't remember any survivors being, uh, being found. I think there were on the first day, you know, the first day of 9-11. I didn't get there until the next day. Um, and, you know, it was a strange feeling being there. Um, because I felt totally safe and I felt good being with my old company and seeing the effort that was underway there. It was just incredible. The humanity that just, you know, people coming together, talking to firefighters who were there looking for their fathers or looking for their sons or looking for their brothers. Um, and 
uh, yeah, I like I said, I just felt privileged to be there. And I've said this many times before, I went there to help and I was being helped. It helped me to be there. Um, and it felt great to be connected with my company, Engine 55, because I had sort of lost touch with them. I, you know, I left the fire department in 84, 85 and moved to Brooklyn. And, you know, uh, in the intervening year, sometimes I would go and visit the firehouse, but there were mostly new guys there. And it just, you know, it just felt maybe a little bit awkward. So, you know, I just sort of didn't visit as much. And every once in a while there would be like a reunion, you know, of the guys that I used to know, but, um, but now I stay in touch, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I see them at fundraisers. I go to the firehouse every anniversary of 9-11 to be with the families, to be with the company. Um, and my time there, you know, uh, yeah, I was just, you know, just helping out on, on uh, the bucket line. One of the most moving days there, you know, that really affected a lot of us was getting closer to the, uh, you know, where, where it was burning the most and where, uh, you know, on the top of the pile. And it was a few days after, and on that day, they found the bodies of uh, the company Engine 24 and Ladder 5. And those bodies were intact, you know, they were passed, you know, they were, they were put in body bags and passed along. And that's, you know, I mean, I really felt it that day. Um, just the, you know, the incredible sacrifice and the loss of uh, all of the first responders, um, you know, and, and also everybody who was in that building, you know, you just felt it was still hard to comprehend 3000 or so people that, that were, you know, gone in an instant. Um, and I remember there was a firefighter there who said, well, we always, you know, firefighters always kind of joke around with each other, like uh, as a way of saying goodbye, they say, see you at the big one. And he says, I guess this is the big one. Um, and, and even though, you know, people were, you know, there was that feel, you know, tremendous feeling of sadness, but also, um, I don't know what the right word is. Um, sometimes I use the word uh, joy, but I almost feel guilty using that word because um, there was something about the witnessing and being part of that effort of being there um, and seeing the humanity, you know, in the aftermath of such evil. Could, you, you couldn't, it couldn't help but lift your spirits and your heart and um, and like I said, it felt good to be there. Uh, I was only there for a few days um, uh, because by the end of that week, then a lot of the heavy machinery was coming in and removing a lot of, you know, the, the, the rubble. And I was standing around a lot more than I was helping. And I thought I, the last thing I want to do is be in the way. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be in the way. And so um, I decided, you know, that, that that was enough that, that, you know, I really wasn't needed if I was ever needed, you know, but I just thought I, I don't, I don't want to just, just stand, stand around. And th then I started to feel anxious and 
yeah, in the weeks and months that followed that, that's when I really started to feel, I think what a lot of people were feeling, that anxiety, depression, fear, um, and yeah, that really hit me hard. And that's when I realized, wow, that, you know, while I was there, I didn't really feel a lot of that. I felt, it just felt good to be there. There was no place in the world that I wanted to be. Um, and with, you know, all of the firefighters and first responders that I was with, that just, it just felt, it just felt right. And I'm so grateful that I was able um, to, you know, help out a little bit, but also to, to witness it. And uh, yeah, and I did take some video of it and didn't really look at it for years and years and years, you know. Um, well, that's not true. I did look at it a little bit in the month after um, and then just put it away. And then a few years ago, um, I have a production company with my producing partner, Ren Olive, and uh, we made a documentary called uh, A Good Job, Stories of the FDNY. <clears throat> and so some of the footage that I took was used in the documentary, the film uh, directed by Liz Gar Garbus. And, you know, one of the things about 9-11, what it brought out, you know, for the fire department is uh, the need for counseling. Um, uh, and it wasn't until like a few years after 9-11 that I was able to meet uh, Nancy Carbone. I was introduced to her by um, uh, Marion Fontana. She lost her husband, uh, Dave Fontana, who was a firefighter in Park Slope, Squad One in Brooklyn. And um, I got to know her and her son, Aiden. And um, through her, she told me about Nancy Carbone, who had this organization called Friends of Firefighters that provides uh, free mental health services to firefighters, active, retired, and their families, which was hugely important because, you know, all these firefighters that were down there for months and months, excuse me, months and months on end and didn't see their families. They were going to funerals uh, all the time. They were either going to funerals or they were at the site and it took a toll, you know, not only on them, but on their families. And so I just thought it was really smart that Nancy was offering this counseling to the whole firefighting community. And, but what was also brought out was that, um, yeah, firefighters rightly so got a lot of attention, you know, uh, because, of their heroics and for what they did in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, but they've been doing this all along. You know, there have been, you know, there have been many instances, you know, terrible fires to firefighters lose, lose their lives and um, or firefighters that um, have seen just awful, awful things and didn't have an outlet, you know, didn't, you know, didn't feel comfortable sharing it with their family. Maybe they would talk about it a little bit with other firefighters, but they would not, the, the thought of, of going to th in, into therapy, it wouldn't even really occur to them. Um, so what 9-11 also brought out was that guys who had experienced horrible tragedies before 9-11, they started to come forward as well. And some of them that had been through awful disasters in the past were now helping the younger firefighters who had experienced 9-11. So just to be clear, you know, the FDNY does have their own counseling unit and they do a great job. Um, but there are many firefighters who don't feel comfortable going through the department. You know, they want it to be completely private and so that's what Nancy provides. 
She provides a firehouse atmosphere. She has a firehouse, an old uh, firehouse in Red Hook. And that's where a lot of the counseling takes place. So it's totally competent potential. And, you know, the members, you know, they, they might feel a little bit more comfortable going to uh, an outside, you know, uh, place that's not officially within the fire department, but still feels like the fire department. Um, and they can, they don't even have to go for counseling. They, you know, Nancy has these, you know, uh, breakfasts there and guys can just meet in the kitchen and, you know, feel like they're, they're back at the, the firehouse, you know, um, I think a big need for counseling is for guys that are retired, you know, that, um, just are missing that camaraderie and that, you know, kind of fellowship with their brothers and sisters that they that they missed that they that they could you know just share st stories with or be around um so it's a wonderful thing that you know that friends of firefighters is there and um so since then yeah i've just been uh you know trying to help nancy out you know and and her organization whenever i can also, there are other organizations like the Leary Foundation, and uh, he does great stuff for the department. And um, that's my story. <laughs> what, what people don't know, it, it's not just that Steve feels a kinship for Friends of Firefighters. I mean, he's there. He's on the advisory board. He does fundraising. I mean, he really really helps this organization. I know because I'm on the board of directors. So, I mean, he's the real deal. What shocked me, Steve, and I only recently saw the statistic that there was a study that 47% of firefighters have considered suicide. That blew me away. Yeah, wow, wow. I mean, and here's another thing that I didn't mention that um, you know, of course, afterwards, you know, the guys, uh, you know, the firefighters that were there for months on end are now dealing with cancer related, you know, 9-11 cancer related illnesses and they are dying and they're, and they are sick. And, you know, that's another, that is another big thing that the fire department has to deal with. Of course, this past year with the pandemic, COVID was, you know, a big issue for them that really put a lot of stress in their lives. And now with the 20th anniversary of 9-11 coming up, it's a it's definitely a trigger. You know, it's um, you know, I think there there will be more attention paid, you know, to 9-11 this year because it's the 20th anniversary and um, yeah, and so a lot of the members are going to be reliving it even more vividly than maybe in the past few few years. So, I mean, that is a shocking statistic, and um, I just want to encourage all firefighters that if you're you know feeling if you're feeling in any way, um, yeah, depressed, hopeless, you know, just know that. You're not alone and there's help. There's help out there and, um, and we want to help. We lost 343 FDNYers on 9-11. As of yesterday, we lost another 250 to 9-11 illnesses. And the firefighters who were there on 9-11 or who worked on the pile after tell me that it's not a matter of if I'm going to get sick over, I'm looking over my shoulder, when am I going to get sick? Which is hard enough on them, but think of the families as well of these firefighters who have only lived 9-11 these last 20 years, have only lived with their PTSD, have only lived with this fear of illnesses. It's 
the wives who need the therapy as well, and the children, because the children are suffering and they don't even know that it's because of 9-11. And Friends of Firefighters provides that service for free. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's another documentary that uh, Ren Arthur and I are uh, helping to get out there. And it was made by a firefighter's daughter. Her name is uh, Bridget Gorm Gormley. I know her. You know Bridget, yeah. So um, her dad you know, died of a 9-11 related ca cancer. And so she made, you know, a film that, you know, it's part personal story to her. And she had access to the guys that he worked with. And it's great to see those guys and hear them talk, but it's not, but it's heartbreaking. And then she goes into the larger, you know, concerns of the department and how many have gotten sick, how the city, how our government tried to cover up how we went, got, you know, tried to get back to normal too fast. And it's a very relevant, I think, to today with the pandemic of, you know, of trying to get back, you know, to quote unquote normal too soon. And, uh, we, and it caused a, a lot of, you know, problems. Uh, in the case of 9-11, it caused many, many, many deaths. And like you said, it affects the families. There's one really poignant, you know, story in the film, and the film is called Dust, and of a firefighter who, it was his first day, the 9-11, you know, that was his first day, that was his first job, or well, maybe not his first day, but that was, that was his first job, his first fire. And um, he just has a whole host of problems that, um, yeah, he's got young kids and they'll always, you know, they'll just always know him as someone who's got, you know, all these health problems and not even really understanding like, like where it came from. I mean, in time they'll, they'll know, but yeah, so this, you know, this is going to be going on for, I think, generations, you know, it's, um, um, and I think it's really important, you know, when, you know, when we say that we'll never forget to really mean that, you know, um, it, it was, it's horrible that, that, you know, they, that all of the first responders and John Stewart was a big part of this and, um, uh, and John Feel had to keep going, you know, to DC so that the funding would not run out and that there would be enough funding for you know the the first responders all the first responders and people who were living in that area that were that were told that it was safe you know uh, the students who went who went back to school that there should be funding you know for and it should never run out because people will be getting sick for years and years and years to come and people who worked in the area and volunteered. And I'll tell you what makes me angry, Steve. Yeah. I'm, I'm grateful that the government finally came through and giving free health care to anyone who may be suffering from a 9-11 illness and providing compensation through the Victim Compensation Fund. But what makes me angry is that if you are one of these victims, you have to find out that these programs exist. The government isn't coming to you. But if you or I owed money to the IRS, they would certainly find us, but they are not finding the victims of 9-11 and all the first responders who came in from the suburbs and every single state in the United States. How do they know about these programs? How do they connect the dots to their cancer 15 years ago that they may have recovered from? It just makes me angry that it's half the job that was done. And the other half is, okay, now you find us if you need the help. Right. Anyway, uh, how long were you a firefighter with the FDNY? I um, got on in November of 1980. And then I took a leave of absence in uh, the fall of 1984 to, um, you know, I was, I was pursuing acting at the same time I was on 
I was on the job and um, I uh, was doing a play and I was doing a, an independent film. And anyway, I just kept extending the leave of absence and I never went back. And um, um, they all thought I was you know, crazy for leaving. And I thought, I mean, it, 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 it was a crazy thing to do. <laughs> Um, but if I didn't love acting so so much, um, I just felt like you know I was getting opportunities and I just had to I had to follow them. Um, but I was always sad that I had lost my connection to the fire department. And of course, I hate the reason that I've been reconnected with them, but I'm also so grateful that I had that connection back in my life. And we're so grateful for your help. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for what you're doing and for documenting these stories. I think it's really important. So thank you so much. Sean.